All right, so for this week, uh, we're going back to all creatures, great and small land. And this is where I can never really predict what's going to be popular or whatever. Because when, uh, like say when we did the Waltons, so we did the main Walton show, but then we did that movie that preceded the Waltons, Spencer's Mountain. And then we did the CW remake of the Waltons. And I just presumed that the original Waltons would get the most views and the most engagement or whatever because it's the famous show. But the other two videos have way more views, tons more. And, uh, and yeah, I guess it's just because my only theory is like if you search for the Waltons, a million people have talked about the Waltons, but if you search for the CW Waltons or you search for Spencer's Mountain, very few people have talked about those besides us. So those are like on YouTube, say those are the videos that get way more views. So who knows, maybe this will be a similar case in my mind that we did, uh, you know, uh, All Creatures Great and Small, and we compared and contrasted it to the 2020 remake. And whereas this is this, in doing that, I learned about this forgotten All Creatures Great and Small movie from 1975. And who knows, like, again, to me, this is obscure and weird, and who's even, who even knew that was a thing? But who knows, maybe because it's so obscure and weird and no one else is talking about it, maybe this is useful. <laughs> it wasn't a pilot, was it, for the uh, No, I've got for the, the original TV show? I've got some, some facts and deets about it, So, because uh, again, this sort of feels a bit redundant to me. It's like it's just going to be all creatures great and small again, right? I mean, we already talked about it twice and <laughs> it's two different versions this is just yet another version we're basically just going back to it because why not you know all creatures great and small is just a pleasant it's a pleasant uh, situation it's kind of a neat thing so when i found this when i managed to dig it up i was like well why not you know let's just see yet another take on on this idea of like you know another set of actors playing these parts so in this case in the 1975 all creatures great and small uh simon ward plays James Harriet. Oh yes, he was a quite a famous British actor from the, the early seventies. I'm gonna say. Yeah, well, that's when this is. So uh, yeah, I was gonna ask because his he's got like a, his wiki page is quite. You know, he's done quite a few things. Yeah. I was yeah, curious he, if you would know him. He was quite well known in, uh, you know, the the handsome man in a lot of espionage films, that sort of thing. Right, and then the other one which I didn't realize is. Uh, Siegfried is played by Anthony Hopkins. I didn't realize that. Oh yeah. So okay, good choice. So that's quite a quite a big name. So basically, All Creatures Great and Small. It was a compilation of Harriet's first two books in the British releases. It was called uh, If Only They Could Talk, I believe, and It Shouldn't Happen to a Vet. Were the actual names of the first two books. They combined them together in America and released it as All Creatures Great and Small which is where that title came from. It's from a, like a poem. It's a, it's a, isn't it a, a biblical thing? All creatures great and small, the Lord God made them all. Yeah, um, I mean, that's that's the gist of it. <laughs> I don't know if it's from the Bible or not, but, it, but, but it's some reference to the Lord God. But basically, uh, yeah, because the other line is uh, all things bright and beautiful because that's what the next compilation oh, was called. Just, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small. That's an Anglican hymn. Oh, there you go. There. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's interesting that they, uh, I don't know if that was Harriet's idea, if it was the publisher, but that, that's but, but those are the titles that, that caught on. And uh, anyway, this All Creatures Great and Small book compilation sold really well in the United States, so they optioned the film rights to it, but the film, it was made for NBC's Hallmark Hall of Fame in America, but it was theatrically released outside of America. So this is a TV movie slash not TV movie. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a step up from the average TV movie because in England it was a real movie, but here it wasn't released in theaters. So it's this weird sort of middle ground. And I just thought that was interesting too. It's like NBC's Hallmark Hall of Fame because we... We often use the Hallmark film as a pejorative, as like this is like that's how we described the the Walton CW remake. It's like a Hallmark movie. Like that mm. means a bright, shiny, empty film <laughs> of low moral fiber. <laughs> you know, well, they would high moral fiber, low quality. Um, so as it, I looked into that a little bit, and it's kind of interesting. So. Hallmark Hall of Fame ran on NBC from 1951 to 1978, and then different versions of Hallmark films still run to this day. It just never stopped. 
But it seems like that first run on NBC from 51 to 78 was like relatively good. You know, like that wasn't Hallmark movies had not yet become Hallmark movies, you know? Yeah, which are, yeah, the the newer versions are pretty formula and pretty schmaltzy. Right. And everybody's wealthy in them. Yeah. And I, I get the sense from this that uh, the, the few reviews I could find of this, this film, the criticisms are that it's light. But again, I don't know, how heavy is All Creatures Great and Small really going to get? And maybe that is a touch of that Hallmark. I mean, that'll be interesting to see, too. Just what was the state of a Hallmark film in 1975? It seems like it's probably a lot better than it is now, but it might still have some of that Hallmarkiness. I guess we'll see. But was it made? It was made in Britain, though, right? And then it sounds like a Hallmark bought it. It was like yeah, showed a, it. a co-production. So as far as I can tell, it does seem like it was basically made in Britain, but, uh, but NBC footed half at least half of the bill so again this is like in the millions where i don't know what a normal hallmark movie costs (laughs) i feel like nowadays you could probably make a hallmark movie for 200 grand on a digital camera and i don't know maybe i'm undershooting but even with inflation and stuff like they just they seem so cheap and they seem so bad there's this guy drew gooden uh, on youtube who he he does these reviews of like hallmark christmas movies and they're just they're just shit like even with this guy making fun of them it's still hard to sit through it's like god this is bad (laughs) no they're all they're all they're all formula they're all very harlequin romance kind of thing where you get introduced to the usually the female character she falls in love with this guy who's kind of very standoffish and hard to get along with but you find out that there's some very good reason as to why he's like that and then they fall madly in love and then just before the show ends at the end there's a misunderstanding and all oh, their lives are over and they're both going their separate ways but at the very end they the resolution happens and they get together and they'll live happily ever after you know what's funny what that makes me think of is uh that uh series 50 shades of gray that is like it was like oh it's a little bit uh oh you know bondagey like oh my god he's gonna tie her up and stuff but it's it's just that it's exactly that the you know it's just this chick who's like a secretary for the the mean business guy and oh he's the mean guy and it gets a little spicier i guess than a hallmark but it's that exact yep, plot exactly. she finds out yep. about his childhood trauma and uh, t- t- brings down the ice walls around his cruel heart <laughs> and it's like fuck off <laughs> that's actually i mean it's a different story but that series 50 shades of gray do you know that series twilight it's a vampire series you know just a teen girl who dates a 200 year old vampire same as buffy Basically, Fifty Shades of Grey was fan fiction of Twilight. Like, the author, she was just writing her own Twilight story, and she just changed the names and took out the vampire and made it into her own book. <laughs> it's like, hey, genius, why not? Here's your millions of dollars. Nice work. Anyway, that's a, that's a digression. But yeah, so that's just a, that's a side thing. If, you know, another thing we can look at, not only is this the first adaptation of All Creatures Great and Small, It'll be interesting to see how these different actors take on these characters. I'm especially interested in Siegfried because he was so eccentric but nice in the 1978 version, and he was so much meaner in the 2020 version. And when I think Anthony Hopkins, maybe just because of Silence of the Lambs, I think mean. I'm expecting him to be meaner in this, just based on other things I've seen Anthony Hopkins play. But hey, we'll see. But also just to see the state of the Hallmark movie. This yeah, was, that's, you know. what, that's what we need to kind of really check out. Did, did Hallmark put its mark on it yeah. in this formulaic kind of shows that they've got that are... Well, anyway, let's, let's yeah. check it out. Which I guess, again, the romance thing will probably be a big part. Let's see how much how much of it is veterinarian stuff and how much of it is the romance. Because, again, this wasn't a pilot and it wasn't intended to be a series. It was just one movie. So I assume we're going to move along a lot faster as far as the relationships with the people in the town. But, again, we'll see. So another thing that's kind of interesting, because it was both a TV movie and a theatrical movie, there's two different versions. The TV version is just under 90 minutes, 87 minutes, and the theatrical version is 120. It's the full two hours. The only version I could find is the TV version, so we have the shorter one, but I think that's a good thing, you know? I just like 90-minute movies. It's actually kind of rare. There's not a lot of movies that keep it to a lean hour and a half, but I really do find if you arrange it right, if it's edited properly, it feels as long as a two-hour movie. Like, you can fit in a lot of stuff, where 
the two hour version, not only is it longer, but it feels double long because they probably left in a bunch of stuff that they didn't really need, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I had no option. This was the only version I could find, but I'm glad I got the short one. Like again, I don't know, it's another quick digression about the 90 minute movie, but my favorite example is that movie Train Spotting, because they set out to make a 90 minute movie. They went out of their way to edit it down to 90 minutes. But on the DVD and the Blu-ray, there's all these deleted scenes and you can go watch them and you're like, oh, that's a pretty good scene. That's a neat thing. Like there's a scene about like Begbie meeting his, his alcoholic dad and sort of explains why he's so violent. And it's like, okay, that's a good scene. But if you added that in and added in this scene and added in that little scene, next thing you know, the movie's 20 minutes longer and the movie would have been worse even if you put in these scenes that are fine. And I really feel like that's something uh, editing is highly underrated in movies because like they just they don't need to be as long as they are. So True anyway. enough, some of it, some of that. I've much, I'm watching and again diverting here. Some more of the Outer Limits because I've got them on DVD. Right. Oh man, again, some of them are excellent, but they could do with some serious editing. They don't need to be a full hour in length. Yeah, I think like, I'm sure we brought it up when we did that show, but uh, my favorite, like the clearest example of that to me is with The Twilight Zone, where seasons one, two, three, and five were half an hour, and those are all the classic episodes. Season four, they tried to, to expand it to an hour, and those are no one's favorite episodes. Like, it was just too much. You just don't need it. So yeah, it's, uh, that made it very clear. Uh, so a couple uh, neat little quotes from Simon Ward. The lead role was given to Simon Ward, who later recalled, I hadn't known the books, and a lot of people hadn't known about them then, so at that time I wasn't taking on a national icon. So that's a nice point, it's like no one knew yet about All Creatures Great and Small, so that made it a little easier on him. And he said, it's always nerve-wracking playing a real person, particularly if that real person is still alive and comes and sits on the set watching you. Although Harriet was the most charming, wonderful man who I really adored and I kept in touch with until he died. And Simon Ward also said, The roughest thing was putting a hand up a pregnant mare. For the film, I had to do it again and again. <laughs> so yeah, I think that is a rite of passage for everyone who plays James Harriet. At some point in real life and my, maybe in the modern day, it's a fake horse I don't, or a fake cow. But... Yeah, in the modern one, remember another when he, when he withdrew his arm, it he doesn't have all that crap on the bag. Yeah. But those earlier shows, oh yeah, that yeah. that's the real thing, and I imagine we're going to see the. That's one thing about the Brits, eh? You know, they don't frig around with that kind of shit if it's real <laughs> shit. Yeah. They're dealing with real shit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so then the only other little thing is that uh, so this movie did pretty well apparently because in 1976 they did do one more before the 1978 series they did a sequel movie but again they recast it it's different actors yet again so I was like hmm like what's this all about like you know this is probably diminishing returns we probably don't need to watch yet another all creature great and small movie but it doesn't matter because I couldn't find it I'm actually amazed I found this version and uh the reason, it turns out, why I couldn't find it is that the 1976 sequel, it was released on VHS in the 1990s, but never on DVD. So it's just not digitally available. So I guess I would say to anyone listening to this, keep your eyes peeled if you're at a thrift store, you know, it's particularly in England, but I guess it did get released here, I believe. If you can find the VHS tape of the 1976 All Creatures Great and Small and convert it to a computer format and upload it somewhere, the world does not have it. It's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you can find an old VHS, I don't know. That's just, that's just a lost thing. But again, I don't know. That's a lot of All Creatures Great and Small. That's, that's the one step too far. So if, you're gonna, if there's going to be a piece of the puzzle missing, I think it's fine that the other movie no one ever heard of is <laughs> missing that doesn't have Anthony Hopkins and Simon Ward in it. That's probably fine. But I don't know. Just uh, you know, keep your eyes peeled out there. If someone's got it in their grandma's fucking attic or something, you know, go, uh, go convert that thing. <laughs> convert that thing to computer. And then tell us so we can watch it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah, as for where I got this, for anyone who wants to watch along with us, uh, all I can tell you is piracy, man. I think I got it off the Pirate Bay or whatever, and it still was like one person, like one person in the world that's seeding this file. So I can't tell you an easy way to see this, because uh, I'm shocked that I even found it myself. I guess you can just listen to our review of it and uh, imagine it. <laughs> Oh, 
say they do spend a whole lot of time in a lot of gushy love scenes. Yeah, for the first time someone ever made an adaptation of All Creatures Great and Small, and obviously it had to be very condensed because the entire thing had to fit within the span of one movie. So I'd say given those constraints, they did a pretty good job. Yeah, yeah. It didn't have any like the things I was worried about, that it would be uh, hallmarky, <laughs> you know, or even that it would just be kind of Americanized because it was, uh, you know, half financed by America. But it felt pretty British to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, the romance between him and Helen moved right along there. Like he took her out to met her at the at the house, took her out to dinner, went to the movies, married her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was the only thing about it being condensed is obviously like it goes way faster. Like it's all those those classic scenes from the first episode of All Creatures Great and Small happen within five minutes because they basically, it's like the whole season, the first series or two all happening in 90 minutes. But all of that seemed fine. Like it was a little quick, but he's getting to know the locals. He's doing his vet stuff. The only part that was weird was the, the relationship because, you know, we've gone through a whole year, but it doesn't feel like it because it's so quick. Well, they had to tell us. <laughs> that a year had gone by because yeah. <laughs> otherwise we would have, wow, that's a whirlwind romance. <laughs> and even that, I kind of had a feeling because that like 40 minutes in, it took a distinct shift away from the life of being a vet into he's trying to date the, the one lady and then that kind of doesn't go well. So then he's dating this other woman and then he they see each other on dates with other people. And, da, da, da. and I was like, oh, did this just turn into the Hallmark movie? But no, that was only 10 minutes, and yeah, they just... So yeah, it's a... I mean, I just... It's obviously not the classic version. The 1978 full series is obviously the sort of definitive All Creatures Great and Small, but I really had nothing against this version. I thought no. it was all right. No, it was okay. Again, uh, it took a little while to get your tongue around or your head around some of the the lingo and the accents of that, the, that Yorkshire accent. Because some of the some of the farmers there, I what I couldn't <laughs> yeah. figure what they were talking about. It's <laughs> it, it's interesting too, like when you have to condense something down like this, what they choose to focus on. Because actually, uh, Siegfried Anthony Hopkins, who really, I mean, he was in it, but he was very much a, a side character. You know, where I really get the sense in the full All Creatures Great and Small, like it's about those two guys. Where here, it's about just James Harriet and then secondarily it's about his romance life and then tertiarily it's about because I guess I just only so much time in the day but they they wasted no time in introducing characters like Helen got introduced just I'm at the farm oh there's this girl here with a, a little calf that's got a broken leg and that's all that's 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 all the introduction is the brother Tristan He's, he's in it really fast. Yeah, if anything, there's maybe too many characters. Because Tristan, I mean, I guess it's good to put him in, but you could have left him out. <laughs> Fans of the book would have been upset. But uh, the one they really could have combined is how they have not only the housekeeper, but then they bring in the lady to help them do finances and stuff. You could easily, like, uh, amalgamate those into one character. <laughs> it's weird that they were both. But it moved right along. I, it, uh, it covered all the bases, and it certainly wasn't syrupy or... I also like, too, that it was definitely just, you can tell it had that um, pseudo-movie, or at the very least, TV movie budget, because uh, it sidestepped that thing that you always see with old British shows, where it's like two different things. When they're outside, it's filmed on film, and it looks like a movie, and then as soon as they go inside, it's like they're on a little stage, like a little playset, where this one basically looked the same all around. <laughs> you know, it didn't have that that British TV feeling of like, we've just walked into another dimension. Although speaking of another dimension, that's what I was thinking of is, uh, do you remember the show from the nineties? It was called Sliders. And uh, I don't, don't, don't know it. It was basically just that they kept sliding into, so they're not going into the future or the past. They're just going into an alternate present. Each time they show up, they got to figure out what happened. You know, like, is this the world where the Nazis won World War II? Or is this the world where hamburgers eat people <laughs> whatever you know just something is different that's what i thought of uh with this is it is like we're seeing all of the versions of all creatures great and small from like different dimensions <laughs> you know like this just could have been the 
the version from another world because <laughs> it's it's the same but it's different it's just like a little bit different yeah and beyond that i guess uh, i mean i guess yeah, it's just one of those things i mean it is our third kick at the can with all creatures great and small there's only so much to say about it but uh wasn't bad so hey that's good <laughs> could be worse and again i guess then the natural next step would be for us to watch the 1976 version with yet another uh casting but it's uh it's not available it does not exist so. you don't know who the people that they were starting that i can look it up let's give it a gander just see to there's see anybody that is uh you know that's well known in this film, John Alderton has taken over the role okay. of James. Okay, John Alderton, yeah. Best known for his roles in Upstairs, Downstairs, Thomas and Sarah, Widow's Playhouse. So, I mean, that's some stuff. Yeah. And Colin Blakely is Siegfried, Blakely. who is known for the films A Man for All Seasons, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, and Murder on the Orient Express. So, still relatively okay. famous people. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. But I guess, yeah, it's just, uh, so again, mayhem, maybe that'd be all right. But, uh, but there's nothing we can do about that one, because that is not around. And again, I do feel like the uh, American titles are so much better. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's called It Shouldn't Happen to a Vet in England, because that was the name of James Harriet's book, where in America it was called All Things Bright and Beautiful, which is just... A way better name. <laughs> like, James Harriet's book titles fucking suck. Let me just bring those up. It's really weird how, how terribly titled they are. If only they could talk, it shouldn't happen to a vet. Let sleeping vets lie. Vet in harness, vets might fly, vet in a spin. The Lord God made them all, it's a little better, and every living thing, so. But I mean, yeah, just, oh, those are later on too i don't know if those are even part of the main series i don't know it's just funny because all creatures great and small and the bright and the beautiful like they just are so nice and flow off the tongue where like let sleeping vets lie what a shit name you're just really trying to cram the word vet in there <laughs> i don't want to end this off just me uh unfairly criticizing a classic of uh you know british literature but i was just surprised that it's like one of those cases where obviously someone at the publishing house, when they were combining these books together, came up with these alternate titles and uh, they nailed it way better. Oh yeah, because here we go. So the collected works. Yeah, the collected ones are called All Creatures Great and Small, All Things Bright and Beautiful, All Things Wise and Wonderful. So anyway, yeah, I guess the only other place to go from here is there was that 2011 series about young James Harriet, but uh, the reviews were really bad, so yeah, uh, we'll save I that think, one. I think enough. we should pass on that. Yeah, and we definitely got our, we, we definitely filled our boots with all creatures great and small, and that's one thing I do like about doing these. Like, again, I don't know if for anyone watching this, this might be probably they're looking for this movie and all they're finding is us talking about it and it's like sorry i don't know what to tell you and there's only so many ways to tell the man's life story and we've seen it in a movie and we've seen it in the tv series the original tv series the new tv series obviously has taken those original stories and dramatized them big time yeah and put the and, pedal and to the metal embellished <laughs> all this stuff and uh but you know if you're looking for a drama hey you know, yep. it's well done. Well, that's one thing, too, I guess I meant to say about this uh, version, too, since this was the first version besides the books, is, uh, you know, we can very much take this franchise for granted now because it's so well known and it ran for so long originally and all these remakes and all this stuff. But this must have been quite a, a, another thing, like I'll say, where I, I thought this was pretty good, this 1975 version, is that having never done this before, it's quite weird, right? Like, it must be a weird project to take on where you're like, okay, so what is this about? It's about a veterinarian in, you know, some fictional nowhere town in 19, in the 1930s. Like, what, are you sure this is actually something anyone's going to want to watch? Like, are we going to lean heavy on the romance thing? Nah, we'll have a little. It's like, so it's really just about him putting his arm inside a mare? Like, I'm afraid so. <laughs> he gets to put down a dog. That's a sad scene. Like, it doesn't sound marketable. It sounds like, you know, if someone brought this to me as a director, I'd be like, uh, are you sure this is what we should be making? This does not sound like it's going to be popular. But yeah, so anyway, that uh, I believe for the time being brings us to uh, the end of uh, our All Creatures Great and Small Adventures. <laughs> for again... Who knows, this could be one of those things that no one ever stumbles upon, and if they do, 
I don't know. Again, I, I assume once again that you're just looking for this movie and you just are wondering where to find it. So <laughs> thepiratebay.org, torrent it, you know, and make your peace with uh, with your God that you've stolen a movie. But again, I know people get so uh, finicky about like, oh, you're not supposed to steal things online, blah, blah, blah. But I feel like there's cases when it's a 1975 made-for-TV movie that no one remembers. Just steal it. No yeah. one cares. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Don't get all in a twist about it. It's fine. People are like that a lot about old video games. Like, the games I played when I was a kid, and nowadays you can just play them on your computer, and people are like, you shouldn't do that. But there's all these cases where it's like, these old video games from the 80s, the companies don't even exist anymore. If you don't steal it, you don't play it. Just steal it. Just steal it. <laughs> Let me be the devil on your shoulder. It doesn't matter. Just steal it. <laughs> well, and in our review over the last few years of all this stuff, look at look at the things that you have tried to find, and they've been destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? That's, that's actually a good point, is uh, in film archiving, TV archiving, and video games, in all this stuff, the pirates oftentimes are the people who are keeping this stuff available and did and it's both especially too now that we're in the digital age i remember there was this uh campaign for a while that would run in movie theaters where they were trying to convince people not to download movies and again like of course on the surface i'm very much like you of course you shouldn't steal things you should pay for the people who worked on these things deserve to get paid but there's these cases where these things are impossible to find and they're just weird and obscure and like just go ahead and steal it And, and come on let's face it if you're somebody something that was made in 1975 you could very well not even be around anymore. So if you worked on it, you're not going to benefit from it. Yeah. Or you're so old <laughs> that you're not going to benefit from it. And when you think think about those years in the BBC years that you said that so much of it was just destroyed. Yeah. Well, who's going to benefit from that? If you If you were lucky enough to be able to find some of that stuff, which is probably you won't because it's gone. But if by some weird twist of fate you found it, like, isn't it better to take it and keep it? Or just say, oh, well, no, I can't take that. My goodness, that's uh, it's a rare thing, but no, I'm sorry. Can't do it. That's illegal. Yeah, it's a very tiresome attitude some people have. Online, I find it's so goody two-shoes. It drives me nuts. Yeah, it's like beyond thinking about the situation. But also, because all this stuff is just digital, it's, I mean, the term stealing isn't even appropriate. Because obviously if you steal a real thing and now that person doesn't have it and you do, that's terrible. You shouldn't do that. But they used to have these ads where they'd say, like, you wouldn't steal a car, would you? So why is it okay to steal a movie? But then there was this comedian whose answer was like, now, you know, if by stealing a car, if I could just make a copy of the car, you still have your car. And now I have another copy of the car and it didn't hurt you at all. I would steal every car. Yeah, of course I would. Well said. 